Warning, the following video contains mathematics. Viewer discretion is advised. Sometimes very simple questions can have very complicated answers. And our system of music theory can be sort of unintuitive, where it can take simple ideas and make them more complicated than they need to be. And that's what I want to demonstrate in this video. I've got a rhythm here that is seemingly innocent. You'll be able to perform it and play it somewhat easily after just a few seconds. But finding a way to notate it is nearly impossible. And just understanding what the rhythm actually is, is strangely complicated. So in this video, I'm going to show you this rhythm, and then I'm going to challenge you to find a way to notate it and to understand what's going on with this rhythm. Then I'm going to walk you through some of the answers that I came up with and how I got to those answers. Then at the end of the video, I'm going to actually compose with these rhythms so we can actually put them to good use. So to get started, let me just show you what this rhythm looks like if I programmed it into a drum track on Reason. I'll start off by clicking in the very last 16th note of this measure. I'll drag that note out so it extends past the first eighth note. Then I'll switch to eighth notes and click in a single eighth note on the and of one. From there, I'll switch to eighth note triplets. I'll click in one eighth note triplet, two eighth note triplets, and then I'll switch back to sixteenth notes and place a sixteenth note at the very end. From here, I'll repeat the same pattern. I'll extend the sixteenth note by a single eighth note, add in a single eighth note, and then add in one note of a triplet, two notes of a triplet, and another sixteenth note. Now you should be taking note of this strange gap between my triplet note and my sixteenth note. So here's what the rhythm sounds like if we play it. So it's a pretty awkward rhythm, but it's not insane, and it's fairly playable. The problem is, though, is trying to find a way to write it. So what I want you to do is find a way to write those exact same pulses in really any time signature. You don't have to stay in 4-4. Four, four. And also try to figure out what is the length of that gap that we saw between those two notes, and how long should this note of the sequence ring out for. I'll take a quick break to give you a chance to figure this out. So before I just show you the final rhythm that I came up with, I want to walk you through how I got there. So to get started solving this, we're going to simplify the rhythm a bit so it doesn't go between the measures. Let's notate it like this instead. Two eighth notes and a grouping of eighth note triplets. That takes up two whole beats, so we can think of this as a measure of 2-4. However, I don't want this last triplet note to be played at all. Instead, I want a sixteenth note to play at the very last moment before the measure ends. So if I'm counting sixteenth notes, it should fall on 1 E and a 2 E and a. So now our full rhythm sounds like this. 1 and 2 trip, a 1 and 2 trip, a 1 and 2 trip, a 1. This is not legal notation. You can't just cram a 16th note in here because the measure is already full. These two eighth notes take up a full beat and this triplet grouping takes up a full beat. What we need to discover is the exact value of this note right here. If it's actually played as an eighth note triplet, it would ring out for one third of a beat. And that means my next note would occur with one third of the beat remaining. But I need my last note to occur with one quarter of the beat remaining. How long is it really supposed to ring out for? We can answer that question for every other note easily, with the exception of this one. So let's simplify things by just looking at the triplet group. This takes up one full beat. The first note would take up a third of a beat since there are three eighth note triplets in a quarter note. The second note is of unknown value. And we don't even want to play this last note. Instead, we want a sixteenth note that takes up one quarter of a beat. So if we take a full beat and subtract one third, and then subtract one fourth, we'll know the remainder of the beat, which would be the correct value for our mystery note. So let's do a little math. One minus one third minus one fourth works out to twelve twelfths minus four twelfths minus three twelfths. And that gives us an answer of five twelfths. So this note right here needs to ring out for a total of five twelfths of a beat. So how do we figure out what 5 twelfths of a beat is? We could subdivide a quarter note into eighth note triplets. That's three notes per beat. We could also do 16th note triplets. That would be six notes per beat. And we could also do 32nd note triplets, and that is 12 notes per beat. So 5 twelfths of one beat is the same thing as five 32nd note triplets. Likewise, one third of our beat is four 32nd note triplets, and one fourth of our beat is three 32nd note triplets. So we could write out our rhythm like this now but that's basically uncountable. No human could be reasonably expected to parse triplets at that level. But there's hope. We can make this readable by expanding it and removing the triplet sign. To do that, we can multiply the entire rhythm by a factor of three. 
Multiply this eighth note by three and you get three eighth notes, or a dotted quarter note. Do the same thing to this eighth note. Now this note here used to be worth one third of a beat, but multiplying it by three means it's worth just a single beat, or a quarter note. Let's skip the weird note for now and go to our sixteenth note. Multiply that by three and you have three sixteenth notes, or a dotted eighth note. Now our mystery note used to be worth five twelfths of a single beat, but after multiplying that by three, it's now worth fifteen twelfths of a beat, which is the same thing as one and a quarter. One and one quarter beats is the same thing as a quarter note tied to a sixteenth note. So we could write that in like this. Now, to make things a little more readable, let's group this last section correctly. And voila, the unwritable rhythm in elegant simplicity. It's still completely ridiculous to count, and it's no longer in 4-4, but we could fix that by simply treating the entire thing as a tuplet of six beats to four beats. So I'll admit it, I think it's insane that we have to go through this much work to figure out what's going on in a simple rhythm like this. I think most musicians would agree, just by describing the rhythm and understanding it on its basic level is enough to be able to perform it. Even though you're not actually counting 5 24ths of a beat, you're performing 5 24ths of a beat when you do this. Now to get the rhythm that I showed you at the beginning of the video, all I have to do is take this meter and play it twice, and then I can tie the last 16th note to the very first 8th note, and I've got the rhythm that we started with. This specific rhythm was brought to my attention on the Music Theory subreddit by user Swimming Fail. He had written this rhythm in a DAW and had no way to write it out for his fellow musicians, and asked the forum, hey, what do I do to notate this? And I was thoroughly entertained by the diverse replies that he received. Uh, some people said that you should just write it as a dragged note, the note should be slightly late. Some people tried writing in two voicings, which I think is probably the easiest way to notate it. And others just flat out claimed that it is unwritable because it's too weird. And I never accept that as an answer. So I decided to go through the math here and was really freaked out at how difficult it was to solve. So for me, the next step was to take some of these concepts and actually try to apply them. I found it's very helpful to take the theory that you're learning and instantly start writing with it and using it. And uh, what I decided to do is take this unwritable rhythm and play it three times and do a slight variation on it the fourth time. Uh, I wrote a bass line and a chord progression in F sharp Dorian, which is essentially just the same thing as the key of E major, just revolving around that second tone. For me, that was actually pretty tricky to get the timing for it. This is not an intuitive rhythm for me at all, so I had to listen to it a few times after I programmed it in. But also understanding 16th note feels versus triplet feels is invaluable. So for me, I can kind of turn off the brain and just go by feel because I have so much practice working with the triplet feel and working with the 16th note feel. I know what it feels like to play the last uh of a measure. And I know what it feels like to play triplets over a pulse. So I'm kind of not really counting at this point, even though I'm counting with my mouth, I'm really trying to focus on the feel of what a triplet the feel feels like and what a 16th note feels like, but still surprisingly difficult to play at this speed. So I wrote those rhythms as a bass part, and then on top of that I just wrote a guitar part that's an F sharp minor 9 to a B7, and that gives me that nice little Dorian flair. I always like going from a minor 1 chord to a major 4 chord. It gives you a nice smooth, funky, kind of jazzy sound. I also added a very, very simple line on top just to kind of make things a little groovier and hippier. And then last I wrote a solo in F sharp Dorian uh, that's kind of switches between the Dorian scale and just the pentatonic minor scale. So here's what it sounds like putting that all together. pretty entertaining and it was pretty mind expanding for me to do something like this. You know, in Western rhythm, everything revolves around the number four. The whole note is king. So when you start working with groupings of three, it instantly gets a little bit more complicated. And I think it really creates some deficiencies in our abilities to interpret rhythms easily. I mean, even though that this is the correct rhythm, this is not easy to parse. 
even though I can count it, counting it at the right speed is not practical. It's much more practical to just internalize this rhythm, understand it on its surface level, and then perform it from there. Because seeing something like this and expecting somebody to read it instantly, I don't think is fair to any musician. Now it's worth bringing up the idea of an irrational time signature here. Some of you might have tried uh, shifting into an irrational time signature here, but I don't think it helps us much in this instance. What would really help us is if we had a solid notation for a third note, a note that just takes up one third of a beat, a single solitary note like that. And that doesn't exist, because when you start adding in third notes, you start getting irrational time signatures that are shaved off or added on by thirds of a beat. And uh, I'm totally fine with that, personally. Um, it just seems like we need to update our music theory system to accommodate for stuff like that a little bit better. If that exists and I haven't found it, please let me know. Uh, I'm open to other suggestions on how to notate this rhythm besides just this. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it. If you did enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. If you really liked this video, then please check out my Patreon. That's where you can support videos like this going forward. Thanks for watching.